Um, right. Well, thank you for that. That's that's certainly very exciting. And yes, brown brownian motion makes us happy. Right. Uh, another two uh, relatively shortish ones. I'm trying to keep mine short this week. Uh, these are both from Slate, um, which does some pretty fine writing sometimes, at least. <laughs> the first one is 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 for the laughs because we do like the lols. Um, <laughs> have you ever heard the "That's what she said" joke? So, well. Basically, no. subject could eat object all day, and then someone pipes up and goes, that's what she said, and then you and, and all your college dorm friends fall over laughing. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Researchers have developed a computer program that helps you identify the perfect <laughs> opening for a that's what she said joke. Yes. <laughs> we have developed a computer that knows how to do this. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. It is actually quite clever, because obviously you've got to define a sentence as funny. Um, they define what a double entendre is, and and um, they define it as being a type of metaphor which brings together two conceptual realms, one straight-laced and one raunchy. So, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty cheap way to get a laugh, but they're still funny. Uh, and so they give, for example, banana is one example of a, a seemingly respectable noun that could moonlight in, in um, <clears throat> sexier writing. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. They've even managed to call it, and this is fantastic, the acronym they've come up for their computer program is Deviant, which I think is just <laughs> marvelous. Um, and now that it's been properly trained, uh, you can feed it a string of text, and it can tell you whether tacking on the four magic words will result in hilarity. Apparently, it's got, they, they say, about the same dirty joke-telling ability as a 12-year-old boy. Um it can pick out, that's what she said, set up with around 70% accuracy. They reckon that number could actually increase to 99.5% if every sentence had a 50% likelihood of being a that's what she said, um, which gives the computer more positive results to work with. Um, <laughs> so so it's kind of cool. I mean, in yeah, future not, right? episodes of TOSP, we'll be building this into our uh, humor segments. <laughs> uh, well, absolutely. I mean, on, on bad days, you know, we may just miss that perfect open. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, okay, so moving along swiftly to, to another article. This is really interesting. Now, um, New Zealand likes to drive a, a little aggressively, shall we say, um, as, as do many countries. It's not exactly specific to here. And I'm sure that we've all screamed at that person who's just driving a little slower on the highway. And you think, man, if we could all just drive faster, we could all get there faster. And in fact, the uh, UK, the Tory government this week came out with what I think is a stunningly stupid idea. But that of raising the speed limit on certain motorway sections to 80 miles an hour. And they're saying that this will give a massive windfall in economic productivity and time saved. Of course, they haven't looked at the fuel increases, you know, increased dependence on foreign fuel. Anyway, we're not going to get into that. That's a bit political. But um, <laughs> uh, what uh, researchers have actually found is that exactly the opposite is true. If you slow everybody down, everybody can actually get there quite a bit quicker. Uh, the phenomenon is called rolling speed harmonization. And it's basically, it holds that by encouraging speed compliance and reducing speed differential between vehicles, you can, uh, well, what they say is volume throughput can be maximized without a physical increase in roadway dimensions. And it does make sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sure anyone who's tried to merge recently, you know, you're supposed to merge like a zipper, but people don't. They scream up at the maximum possible speed and then everyone slows down way too much and complete chaos reigns. Uh, the same thing, a lot of accidents aren't caused by how fast people are going. They're caused by large differentials. So a couple of cars traveling very slowly are just as dangerous as a couple of cars traveling very fast because people um, don't don't know how to handle it and, and you get pileups. So they've been testing this on a route called the I-70 in Colorado, I believe it is. I could be wrong. Uh, I believe it's Colorado. I just having a look, and they found that yes, if if they had people crawl out onto the highway, well, in trucks with signs, um, and say fifty miles, fifty five miles per hour, the traffic did actually did did seem to work a lot better. But of course, as we will have seen here and in the UK, but not as much in the states, there's also the idea of variable control. So you don't have one static speed limit at all. Um, the uh, motorways have little AIs or, or possibly people behind them which can look at it and algorithmically work out what the optimal speed is that all the cars should be running at in order to to decrease uh, traffic drama. So so quite an interesting piece of research. Um, yeah, next time you're driving up somebody's ass on the motorway because you think you'll get there faster, remember it's probably going to end up slowing you down, weirdly enough. Or killing you. Or killing you, which also sucks. <laughs> and slows you down. <laughs> Anyway, on to uh, onto some uh, other weird stuff. Now, this is a particularly cool article for me because it's about nanotech. It was published in a, a journal called uh, Nanoletters, and the 
publication name is Reactive Oxygen Species Driven Angiogenesis by Inorganic Nanorods. Now, that all sounds extremely boring, so let me explain why I'm actually bothering to talk about it. So what these researchers did is they got... Um, Europium hydroxide nanorods. The material doesn't matter. What matters is that these things are nanorods. A lot of people uh, at the moment are worried about the toxicity of nanoparticles, and there's been a fair number of studies showing that they can be um, increasingly toxic. Even non-toxic things, when you nanostructure them, can become toxic. This particular article caught my eye because it's the opposite. So, um, europium hydroxide nanorods are actually non-toxic, completely non-toxic. What they do, however, is they promote angiogenesis. And angiogenesis is the formation of new capillaries. Um, commonly, uh, you know, it's what happens to your tissues when it begins to regenerate and begins to heal. You have to grow new blood vessels to get nutrients, oxygen, all the other good bits and pieces. And what this particular paper shows is exactly how that these europium nanorods do that. How they do it isn't important, but... Um, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, these nanostructuring things can have both positive and negative impacts on um, individual cells and human cells and growth and structure as well. So it's very interesting. And it's a brand new field as well. So it's growing and we don't know too much about it. But people are studying it and they're getting some really, really cool results. That's so this is a potential method for treatment for all sorts of cardiovascular disease, which are the biggest... Um, Causes of morbidity and mortality in the Western world. So, you know, it's kind of important. Completely. And, and again, just lovely to see that, you know, as, as with much science, it, even if it has some bad sides to it, it probably has some good sides to it as well. It's always a double, double edged sword, but nice to see with all the worry about nanotech, um, sort of toxicity at the moment that, that people are nonetheless continuing to power on to see what good can come of it. So hooray for them. Uh, more on things of the very small this week. And this is um, a wired Petri dish, which can give real-time updates. So <laughs> there's a quote from researchers. Uh, Twitter really is just very much part of the zeitgeist these days, it seems. And they say, it's like getting continuous tweets from the cells rather than one occasional postcard. And so it's, it's a prototype, and it's absolutely tiny. I mean, it's smaller than most coins. Um, but what you, what you can do is basically you can grow things in your Petri dish and it will create an image of what's going on it and send that information to a laptop or from inside the incubator so you don't have to keep messing with it type, uh, messing with it. And what they've called the prototype is the ePetri and it's created from Lego blocks. So, so much win in that. Awesome. And a cell phone image sensor in this case, um, Oh, they don't specify. And using light from a Google Android smartphone. So it seems pretty open source. It would certainly be interesting to see what the code for this is. I'm sure if it hasn't already been reverse engineered or released, it will be. <laughs> um, so what they do is place a sample on top of the small image sensor chip, which uses the Android phone's um, LED screen as a light source. And the whole device is then placed in an incubator, and the image sensor chip connects to a, lapso a laptop outside through a wire. And then as the image sensor snaps pictures of the cells growing in real time, the laptop then stitches hundreds of these images together to, to create a high-res image of what's happening on the dish. And apparently the resolution is similar to a traditional microscope. So you can see the contents oh, wow. of cell nuclei, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the paper is going to be in, in proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, if you're keen on, on knowing a lot more. This, this stuff makes me go very, very googly-eyed. And, and so there are a number of benefits to this. For one, um, each device is basically its own little microscope so that you can look at lots and lots of samples all at once, automatically with the laptop, which is great. Um, and you can also get an idea of what's happening on the entire Petri dish at the same time. So with microscopes, you can only look at one little bit, you know, at, at each time, which, which kind of can, well, A, adds massively to your time and constraints to, to your whole picture view. Now, this is particularly useful with stem cells which often change into different types of cells and move around. And I have to say, having worked with them, are famously finicky little bastards. Um, and the team is also working on a completely self-contained um, system with its own incubator, which could, for example, eventually be a diagnostic tool on a doctor's uh, desk. So instead of having that tedious wait where you've got to send stuff to a lab and wait for the diagnostics and then get it back and all of that kind of stuff, he could basically bung it into his little desktop unit and, and kind of do it there, which I imagine would also decrease risk, uh, not risk, sorry, costs, which, which I think would be a really good thing for not only first world countries, but also third world countries where diagnostics and, and even just, um, a transport of samples can be a massive issue. So hooray for that and Lego blocks. <laughs> <laughs> 